Capcom, go ahead. Flight, you copy? Affirmative, Capcom's coming up. All right. Apollo 7, Houston, Capcom. Voice check, how are you reading? Good morning, Jack. I'm there. Now you're five by, Wally. Yeah. Uh, number two, Capcom, give you a check. How do you read, Wally? Hey, Thomas, uh, I'll drop in and see you about 11 days. Roger, everything looks good here. All Delta P lights out, and it's great. <laughs> okay. See you around, Tom. Roger. It's October 11th, 1968. This is the press vantage point for Pad 34 at Cape Kennedy, and I'm Al Hibbs. I'm surrounded by cameras. Behind me, there are TV trailers and a mock-up of the Apollo spacecraft designed to carry men to the moon before the end of 1969. And that's the reason we're here. In a few minutes, we'll witness the first launching of a manned Apollo spacecraft. Right now, we don't know what the outcome of that launch or this mission will be, but over the next half hour, we'll be bringing you an account from now until the final debriefing, which may be days or weeks from now. Inside the capsule are astronauts Wally Schirra, Don Isley, and Walt Cunningham. It was exactly, almost exactly, six years ago that Wally Schirra piloted his Mercury spacecraft six times around the globe. Then, spaceflight was in its infancy. About three years ago, he maneuvered the Gemini 6 into a nose-to-nose -nose rendezvous with Gemini 7, an amazing accomplishment for a space program in its adolescence. And now, this same human being is piloting the test flight of Apollo, a spacecraft designed with some place to go, the moon. A space program and a career coming of age together. Don Isley and Walt Cunningham are both space rookies. They haven't flown before, but perhaps six years from now, they'll be able to look back on an equally illustrious history. We know that the Apollo has never orbited men before, and this is just a shakedown flight to prepare for the later reach to the moon. The powerful Saturn 1B booster is making its debut as a manned launcher, but there have been 14 previous flights of the Saturn 1 family of rockets and every one of them was successful. That's quite an accomplishment and a tribute to the genius of Dr. Werner von Braun. It's time to focus our attention on the launch pad. Share with me chapter one in the log of Apollo, Apollo 7. Roger. Flight recorder, record. Flight recorder, record. PDC align. PDC align. IMCC recorders to flight speed. That's T minus 30 seconds. Network flight, all okay with you? That's fine. Flight. T minus 21 seconds and coming. We have completed our power transfer. 713 launch cable. Now, wait 1.3 minutes now. It's ready to go. Coming up on 10 seconds. 10 seconds. Fido, how about you? 
You're going to go for staging, Captain. Apollo 7, you're a go for staging. Roger, we'll go here, Jack. Roger, go for staging. Still good, booster? That's a firm flight. Okay. Good GET clock flight. Thank you. How are you doing? Looks good, Mike. Kimball's on. Kimball's on, Roger. Kimball's good, Mike. Good, Roger. They jettisoned the tower plug. Got it to initiate. Stand by. Tower's gone. Okay, tower's gone, Sato. Roger, thank you. Got it to this converging plug. Slightly over 10 minutes yeah. after liftoff, Apollo 7's booster cuts off and orbit. The spacecraft stays attached to the S-4B second stage for a couple of revolutions while the crew tests out some procedures necessary on a later flight to the moon. Two hours and 55 minutes after liftoff, they separate from the S-4B. I can see little tiny particles now they rehearse the turnaround and maneuver in which they would pick up their lunar module, or LEM, on a moon landing mission. From here on, the 11-day flight is a succession of engineering tasks, myriad details, matching contingency plans to minor problems that crop up, and proving out the hardware and techniques required to shoot the moon. For example, on the second day, they first fire their service propulsion system, the vital workhorse engine at the back of the service module. With this, they later re-rendezvous with the S-4B, thus simulating a type of space rescue which might be needed in moon orbit. Okay. For the world press, the most exciting news through it all was that Shira and Isley had head colds, and that Shira had determined that the first U.S. telecasts from orbit would wait until the workload settled down. A command decision from the man on the scene, the astronaut. There it is. Hey, we got you. I can see Isley talking there. Hey, Don, turn your head to the right. There you go. Hey, you're picking up. I can read it now. Just a minute. It says, from that uh, lovely Apollo something. You guys should write Apollo it. room. High, High atop, atop everything. Something. High atop everything. Looks good. Tom, you can look at it better on your TV. It's more accurate on your little tube. Right now, we're going to let the astronauts give us their own guided tour of the orbit, as they did at the LBJ Ranch on November 2nd. We'd like to tell you about our flight the easy way. The first thing I'd like to do is to project some of the film that was taken with the spacecraft camera. We had a 16 millimeter camera on board. One of our first concerns was that we had had problems with other crews in extravehicular activity, or EVA. In this case, we were within a large spacecraft where we could move, and we were concerned somewhat about IVA, or intravehicular activity. As a result, we carried extra film with us, and it was quite surprising. IVA was a delight. It was very pleasant and a very easy environment for man to live in, to adapt to immediately. Um. Well, what would you describe this? You were the photographer here. These are the pictures that we took uh, after the S-4B separation and turnaround. And Wally's flying the spacecraft back in uh, very gently, ever so gently, I should say. And we started taking uh, films from, uh, oh, I guess it must have been about 100 feet away and bringing it right on in. I believe the closest pictures we got were something like about 25 feet. We're looking at one of the deployed panels on the slaw, and I believe the one that doesn't quite show up down the lower right-hand corner is the one that uh, apparently came open and then bounced back part way to about 20 degrees opening. Right now we're passing across the... Uh, we, we, we hit the states yet here, Wally? Yes, we're just coming up on the Gulf Coast. We okay, we're coming up along the uh, Gulf Coast of the uh, United States along through here. We took some very interesting stills of the S-4B above each of the major Gulf cities. You're looking down along the Gulf Coast there on the left, and we'll have, uh, there's Apalachicola, I believe. 
It trails right on across uh, Florida, and we had a very beautiful sight that we all were amazed at looking down at the S4B backgrounded by the Cape. And here comes the Cape right over the top. There's where it all began, right there. It's quite surprising, but each of us that come back say that this must be a blue planet because of the uh, bright blues of the ocean and the slight blue haze. Uh, this is the uh, documentary proof that we actually saw the S4B twice. You'll notice that the <laughs> slot panels are all deployed. And it's uh, rotating at a, a fairly healthy clip. And it didn't seem to be having any special orientation. It was uh, rotating about all three axes. I'd like to take over here. This is Don's little rat nest where he kept his food compartment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I found a little crack above the, uh, the optic stoic panel. And there you see where we had our toothbrushes and toothpaste and also our uh, communications helmets when we weren't using them. There's Wally's stowage bag with a red towel sticking out of it. And there's mine with a helmet mounted below it. These were things were just pinned to the wall with snaps. So we're doing a little sightseeing here and uh, this is a an example of how easy it is to move around in zero G. You'll notice we're moving very slowly. It turns out that you can adjust quite readily to the environment. And uh, for several days up there, we were all commenting on how amazed we were that anybody could ever feel bad in, in the environment. It's just uh, the most relaxing sensation you've ever had. The interesting thing to note is we started the sequence, you must have observed there was no one there. Uh, as we continue the sequence, you'll note that Wall is lying down there, Don is getting dressed and attaching his communications harness, and that I'm over in this lower corner. And after we got back and saw this film, we began to realize that someone else must have been holding the camera. <laughs> It seems the television films, uh, that caused some consternation too, and there was no one in the couches. There, there seems to be a tendency of, of uh, the ground, I think, to believe that uh, unless somebody is sitting there, you know, really flying all the time, it's not going to stay up, but it, it's obviously not the case. Don is at the lower equipment bay, uh, as he is typically shown in these films, eating something, uh, <laughs> working at the sextant for an alignment. And rather interestingly enough, we had attachment points to Velcro, which is a sticky material at the base of the spacecraft, to hold us in position. You'll notice Don isn't even using it. He is held in position basically by minor soft handholds. Here's a good example. Don's sitting here, he's fixing a meal, and he's unpacking it right now, and uh, he wants to leave something temporarily in the air. That's where he leaves it. You know, it's also interesting to note I'm sitting sideways, 90 degrees, to what you'd normally think of being the normal way, but that doesn't seem to worry you up there. There isn't really any up or down. <laughs> no one seems to care whether you're uh, <coughs> upside down or not. Turns out you really need very little in the way of attachments or uh, places to hold you. <laughs> Here's Wally doing a demonstration of uh, zero-g uh, maneuverability. And <laughs> You ought, to see, you ought to see him come back. He's just as graceful as you ever saw anybody. <laughs> Gazelle boy Shirai. <laughs> this is very out of character for me, so they're giving me a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> this next scene is not out of character for Wally, though. Here we go. <laughs> now, Walt is the gymnast of the group, and he had to have his opportunity. <laughs> the important thing is, you may note that we're having fun and games. The antics really are to demonstrate that we were very comfortable and did not feel that we were in an awkward environment. Notice the tremendous number of switches and circuit breakers we have, over 700. Not one was inadvertently actuated throughout the whole flight. Walt's preparing some orange juice here. There's the water gun they used to put the water in the bag. He's in the process now of mixing it up. <laughs> <laughs> now this was to illustrate uh, what gas bubbles do when you uh, spin something. They don't actually coalesce into one large bubble, but they do concentrate in the center of the bag due to centrifugal force. By spinning it up, we found that uh, the little small gas bubbles would coalesce in the center. Uh, here I'm showing a plastic bag of coffee. This was our great high point after the rendezvous to have a plastic bag of coffee. Uh, notice the bubbles as they move. And this is quite interesting to us. We've had all sorts of experiments to determine how bubbles